Hi everybody, welcome to another exciting episode of Kevin's Corner. Uh, I'm DM Kevin, uh, and I am here today because something has come across my desk right here, and um, I wanted to go ahead and talk about it today. Now, this may be a kind of a lengthy video, but however, I think it's very important to people who are playing D&D to kind of get an understanding of what I'm going to be talking about. So, without further ado, welcome to role-playing in D&D. Role-playing in D&D has come a long ways. It's gone from knowing what's going on in the battlefield to creating a detailed backstory. Detailed backstories are very important uh, because if you don't know where your character came from, it's hard to know where they're going. So therefore, you have to know where your character is, where they came from, who they are, and what they want to accomplish. A detailed backstory is so important uh, in, in creating a good character and creating a role play situation. Because if you know your parents were killed by orcs, when you come into contact with orcs, you might not be too happy. But if you've lived a happy life, you grew up in a monastery, and you're just walking around the world, everybody's your friend. So, detailed backstory is very important. Now, when I say detailed backstory, um, I've had characters who have written novels. When I say novels, I mean novels of backstory. Pages and pages and pages of backstory. That's awesome. That's great. Because they're, they're diving into their character and they're doing that. But as a GM or DM... When you hand me 15 pages to read, and I have eight characters, eight times 15, that I have to read and remember and memorize, my brain wants to explode. When you're creating a detailed backstory for yourself, 15 pages is great because you can go in-depth details. When you're giving that sheet over to your DM, Condense it down to about one page. Details are not as important to a GM as you think. The DM, if he has a question about details, will ask you about the details. He wants to know where you came from, who you are, why you're there, what your goals are, and how you want to accomplish the goals. That should be the one page you hand over to your GM. I love reading some of the backstories of some of my characters that have been handed to me because I enjoy the storytelling that they that they bring to the table. There have been characters, um, Adra, for example, um, who they were intricate to the storyline. And I go back to my Tyranny of Dragons campaign that we ran. We had it here. We have it here online. If you want to go back and look at it, um, Adder and Blast. That, that that was it was natural. It was a role playing situation that it just fit. A lot of times, characters uh, and players, for example, players want to force things to happen between two characters or between two players, between two. That's okay, but you have to be very careful because if you're playing a certain type of character, um, it may not fit in the storyline as much as you think it would. Um, so detailed backstories are very important for you as a player to know where you came from, where you're going, what your goals are, and how you want to accomplish them. Give a one-page synopsis to the DM, and that will be sufficient, I promise. Now then, role-playing. Know the basics of the game. Now, when I say know the basics of the game, D&D put out what's called the Player Handbook. Now, if you hear what I just said, they put out the Player 
Handbook. This is a guideline of how to play characters, races, classes, combat. It's, it's a guideline. If you read the player handbook from beginning to end, everything inside that player handbook is very open. And a lot of it is designed to be interpreted by the GM or DM to fit certain situations and to move the storyline along. Now, if you want to read it word for word verbatim and you want to be a rules lawyer and come back going, oh no, on page 15, paragraph 4, it says that there are certain GMs and DMs that, that I have seen run games that are very much like that. But I'm not one of those. I am definitely one that I take the rules and I bend them to a certain extent without breaking them. That makes it fun for the players. That makes it fun for the storyline. That makes it fun for everybody. When you're not sitting there and you're not, oh, wait, hold on. I got to look up this. I, got, I, have to, I have to look up this rule because I'm not sure exactly what it does. No, I'm going to make the call at the time and we're going to move forward. Now, later on. You can go back and you can say, oh, okay, well, I'll tweak that next time. Next time, I'll tweak it. Or I may sit there and go, no, this is the way that I want it. This is the way it's going to be run. But if you know the basics of the game, that's the first part of good role playing. If you know the basics of combat, if you know the basics of interaction, if you know the basics of exploration, you can play D&D. &D. And you can actually play it very well. Now, the next part that I'm going to talk about, we could go in depth. And other, and other people have done it. Nerdarchy's done it. Uh, Matt Coville's done it. Uh, Matt Mercer has gone into it a little bit. Uh, understand the races and classes. Um, you know, I, I brought up on a website that I'm looking at right now. Uh, on D&D uh, &D Beyond. Great place for going on and looking at stuff, un trying to understand the races and classes, right? Now then, I'm going to go through these very fairly quickly because I don't want this video to be about this. I want it to be about how to role play them. Now, like the Barbarian, for example, uh, a fierce warrior with a primitive background who can who can, who can enter a battle rage. Rage is one of the biggest things for Barbarian because they take half damage. They can do an extra plus two damage. Um, so there's a lot of things that go into a Barbarian. Now, their, their main thing is strength. So they're going to be strong characters. What you're looking at is you're looking at a strength and constitution based character to where they have high hit points and they're very strong. They can knock down doors. Uh, they can knock people out with their fists if they really want to. That's up to the GM DM discretion. However, I play it is what kind of barbarian are you playing? So, like I said, we're not going to go in depth because that would be a whole different video series that I might bring up later. But I think that's been done by a lot of people. And so I don't really want to beat that to death. I really and truly don't. Now the next one is going to be a bard, an aspiring magician. There it is, magician, who, who whose power echoes the creation, uh, echoes the music of creation. Now then, it says music of creation. Uh, bards are exactly what you would think. They're the singers. They're the dancers. They're they're the performers of the D and D world. They can make a lot of fun. I have a character right now, and I don't think he made me bring him up, Mason. Oh my gosh, he has, he, he's tried to play a couple different classes, and they've kind of fallen short. But then he decided, I want to play a bard. 
And let me tell you, that was the best thing he could have done. Because he found his niche in playing Bard. When it comes to, like, cutting word, holy cow, you want to talk about a guy who can just let it roll, and he plays it, and he does it, and it's awesome. He has characters laughing, he has players laughing, he has just, oh, it, it's phenomenal. He's great at it. This is a charisma-based character, which means... You want to be friend. You want your both the bulk of your stats going to be in charisma, so therefore you can persuade people, you can intimidate people if you really want to. I guess as a bard, but the performance aspect of it is is great. And he is great at performing. Um, when it comes to like cutting people down to the to the just to the nitty gritty, he is awesome, and I think. It comes across in his role playing when he does that. Now these are dexterity and charisma based uh, as well, and so therefore you want high charisma, high dexterity. So therefore you can jump, you can dance, you can do your acrobatics, you can do your stuff on stage, you can dance, and yeah. So it's like when you play a bard, keep that in mind. You want your charisma and your dexterity to be high, so you can do stuff on stage. Moving on into Cleric. Uh, cleric is a wisdom-based character, a priestly champion who wields divine magic in order in service of a higher power. Now, most clerics will follow a god. Um, and when they follow the god, they're doing what the god wants them to. Uh, I play a cleric in my Sunday night session, and um, he follows Serenry. And... Everything is serenary. The light. Follow the light. Be the light. Do the light. Everything's light. Everything. He has a dark side to him, and that's why he kind of got kicked out of where he was. But for the most part, he follows serenary. Uh, wisdom based, which means he is very wise in the world. He knows, he may not know what everything is. But he knows how to fit in. He knows how everything fits together. Um, wisdom and charisma are going to be his two biggest things. And that's mainly for spellcasting. And that's for knowing the world. Uh, next is going to be Druid. Uh, priest of the old faith, wielding the powers of nature and adopting animal forms. Druids have been Druids since uh, the original D&D 1. I mean, way back. Druids have been a class. They're wisdom-based, so they know the world. They know how everything fits. Intelligence and wisdom. They know what things are, and they know how to use those things into the world. And we'll go over intelligence and wisdom a little bit later, which I think you're going to find rather interesting. Then we come up with the fighter class. Uh, fighter class is really cool. It's a master of martial combat skilled in a variety of weapons and armor. It's exactly what it says. It's a fighter. You fight. You are front line. You are in there. You're hacking. You're swinging. You're getting your extra attacks. You're getting your bonus damage. You're getting all this stuff. And you could care less about anybody else. Um, strength, and strength or dexterity, depending on the weapons you use. Because some are dex-based and some are strength-based. So you, depending on what kind of weapon set you want to use, you'll use your strength or dex. And then, um, of course, the biggest ones are going to be the, the strength and constitution. In this one, you want high, you know, you want your high hit points, and you definitely want a lot of strength to swing those weapons and uh, to be able to maybe grapple a lot when you go in. Now then, one of when when the next one came up. Um, this was rather interesting to me because I wasn't exactly sure how it was going to be played until one sec. Uh, in our original game that we played off the starter set, Lost Minds of Fendelver, or uh, yeah, Fendelver, uh, I had Frank come in with a monk one sec, and I was like, ah, man, I don't know about monk. Not sure if he's gonna be able to play it. I mean, this was fairly new. 
And so we were like, okay, well, we're going to try this out. Let me tell you, phenomenal. Once you learn how to use the mechanics of it, it is so much fun, especially as a DM. Uh, they're dexterity and wisdom based. So therefore you want a high dex and a high wisdom. They're going to be wise in the world, knowing how everything fits together. And they're also going to want a high dex. So their acrobatics, their kicks, their all their different special moves they do. The monks need that. Uh, put a little bit more, put a little bit into strength. So that way you're not completely, you know, just dead in the water. But uh, primarily dexterity and wisdom are going to be your two biggest ones right there. Now, we go into one of my favorite, which um, when I was playing World of Warcraft, uh, I actually played a paladin for many, many years. Uh, his name was Mandred, and I loved him. I loved his auras. I loved his smites. Uh, I, I Heavy armor, shield, big sword, swing, heavy damage, strength and charisma base based upon the magic. Um... Paladins are your frontline fighters that have a little bit of that holier than thou that you can put into the role playing aspect of it, and they're really great. I, I enjoy playing a paladin. Um, I really got into rogue, but we'll cover rogues a bit later with Sly, my favorite. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Um, a, next is going to be ranger. Ranged attacks, ranger, awesome. A warrior who combats threats at the edge of civilization. Uh, dexterity and wisdom. Uh, high dex, definitely in, 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 in ranger because you're going to be firing bows, crossbows. You're going to be doing some ranged attacks, so you definitely want that dexterity. And you also want the wisdom. A little bit into strength, so that way they can do climbing and they can climb trees and they can do things like that. Um, rangers are fun. Especially with like Hunter's Mark, um, Advantage, yeah, Rangers are awesome. Uh, Rogue, now then, Sly, yeah, so I had this guy, and uh, my, hi, my name is Sly, uh, I'm a Tabaxi Rogue, Assassin, um, yeah, I'll shoot first, ask questions later, that's if you see me coming. Sly. I, 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 can, I can honestly say that, uh, yeah, I, I come from the other side of the tracks, per se, but you know what? I got gold in my pocket, I live every day, and people really don't know where I'm going or who I am. Rogues are so much fun to play for me personally. Because I have that kind of dark side a little bit <laughs> inside of me. Some of my players uh, might agree. A scoundrel who uses stealth and trickery to overcome obstacles and enemies. That's exactly what a rogue does. A uh, high dex, period. If you can take your dex to 20 right off the bat, you got a, you got a rogue. Uh, dexterity and intelligence. He may not be wise in the world. He may not know how everything fits. But he knows what things are. Very important. Um, then we come up to the magic users. Uh, we're going to come up to Sorcerer first. A spellcaster who draws on inherent magic from a gift or bloodline. You're a sorcerer, Harry. Yeah, I said that sorcerer. I'm sorry, J.K. Rowling. But um, one of the biggest things that, uh, you know... I find that sorcerers are from a bloodline. They are a gift. The, the magic is given to them, or they are born with it. So therefore, it's just there. You know, it's one of those, you wake up one morning, you look over and you're like, oh man, I'm thirsty. I wish I had that glass of water in my hand. <laughs> I have a glass of water in my hand. Okay. I wish that fire was a little bit warmer. Oh, hey, it's a little bit warmer now. So is all the house. But, you know, sorcerers are fun to play. High, uh, you want a high charisma in these uh, basic, uh, for spellcasting. Uh, constitution and charisma saves. Uh, so, therefore, they can uh, take a little bit more. 
So just be careful with playing a sorcerer, though, how you play them. Because with that inherent magic they have, can they control it? Have they learned to control it? Have they gone anywhere to teach them to control it? Or is it just kind of like that wild thing that happens that they don't really know what's going on? All of a sudden, it's like, I don't know. I was looking at the fire one day, and all of a sudden, it's like, I wish it was warmer. And it got hot. You know, so pay attention to that. Uh, then you come up to warlocks. Uh, warlocks, now, warlocks are a wielder of magic that is derived from a bargain with a extra planar entity. Now then, this means that they made a deal or a pact with some god or some entity that gave them the magic. They weren't born with it. They didn't learn it. It was just given to them because they made a bargain, normally for their soul. Uh, so therefore, uh, that's one of the things uh, sorcerers are good at. Uh, high charisma for spellcasting again. Uh, now, the difference between warlocks, they have lived a normal life, so they know how things kind of fit in the world. Then they were given magic, so that's always fun on the, on the wild table because it's like they were given magic, yeah, but can they control it? And then uh, we come up to the last class that's in the player handbook, which is going to be the wizard. Ah, see, this is where you're a wizard, Harry. No, kind of. He did learn it from books, I guess. A scholarly magic user capable of manipulating the structures of reality. Now, they're intelligence-based. Uh, they're very smart. They know books. They're books. Now, they're book smart. Are they street smart? Not always. But they can be. Because their saves are intelligence to wisdom. And so that's very important. Uh, because it's like, they may know what something is, but how does it fit in the world? They may or may not know how it fits in the world. So that's very important. Um, so those are going to be the classes. Now, the other side of the book is going to be your races. I'm going to cover these fairly quickly. Uh, you have Dragonborn, Dwarf, Elf, Gnome, um, half, half elf, half orc, halfling, human, and tiefling. Now, you need to understand all these characters. Like I said, I'm not going to go into detail. I did, I did enough on the, on the classes because classes are, are very important to me. Because if you don't play a class you like, nothing else matters. Hey, you can be any race, uh, but if you don't play the class you like, it doesn't matter. Now then, the thing about um, the understanding the, the races is you need to know like where they came from. Are they indigenous to this area? Did they come in from overseas? Where did they come from? How did they get there? How do you fit into the, that race? If you're a gnome, did you come from the forest? Did you come from rocks? Um, if you're if you are an elf. Are you, are you coming from the high elf society or are you coming from the lower elf society or are you coming from the outlander to where it's like you just kind of, you did your own thing? Uh, if you're a tiefling, tieflings are very hard to play, mainly because the way the D&D 5th edition has brought out tieflings is they were kind of like this semi-demonic looking class or race. But they were never really accepted by a lot of the society, especially in Faerun, mainly because of the way they look. They look like a demon, so therefore people treated them like a demon. So they hold kind of a resentment towards humans, uh, in particular because humans were the ones that actually wanted to enslave them, wanted to put them into their place. Um, so... When, when, you, when, you're, when you're looking at a race to play, read through the whole entire section of that race. Because it's like, it's easy just to sit there and go, oh, I'm going to be a gnome. Okay, well, what benefits do you get as a gnome? Well, I don't know. I just think they're cute. That's great, I guess. But why do you want to be a gnome? Well, you can be a cute little human. 
what benefit is that giving you that's going to make you want to play that? And, and how does it fit in with your race and your class? How do those two come together? That, that's what you want. You want your class and your race. When you finally decide the two, you want them to come together and you go, okay, this is what I am. This is what I'm going to play. All right, enough about races and classes. I could, like, like I said, I could go over those all day long, and um, yeah, I, I, I probably could. Mainly because I like talking about those. Um, now then, the next thing we need to talk about is going to be something very important: understanding the role of the dice. Uh, I don't know how many times um, players will sit there. And they don't understand. Actually, they don't understand why they're rolling dice. It's like, give me, give me an intelligence check. Okay, I rolled. It. I rolled a five. I, as a GM or DM, will pause. I wait for a second. If they don't say anything, I sit there and I go, okay, well, yeah, you don't, you don't know what this item is. Okay, I'm done. Really? Okay. Okay, next. Who wants to do something else? I want to do an investigation check. Okay, roll me a d20. I roll a five. Okay, I pause for a second. They don't say anything. You don't find anything. If, if you don't understand what the roll of the dice does, then it's hard to actually go through and actually get anything accomplished. Um, a five doesn't always mean a fail. A five means you don't really understand, maybe, but you still may know. So, role playing your dice rolls is very important because if you're rolling an acrobatics check to jump or to climb, or if, if you're on, if you're a bard and you're doing an acrobatics check, right? Because I'm going to attempt to do a backflip on the stage to impress everybody. Okay, well, give me an, give me an acrobatics check. I rolled a five. I'll pause. You don't make the jump. You don't do the backflip. As a matter of fact, I'm going to take this now, and I'm going to say, as you attempt to do the backflip, you slip, and you actually land on your back, hurting yourself, to the point that you cannot continue your performance and have to be helped off stage. Now then, if I'm a player and I go, I will do an acrobatics check, do a backflip. Okay, give me give me an acrobatics check. I rolled a five. Oh, well, as I as 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 I as I attempt to start this, I realize that my footing is not right, so I kind of stop and I don't do it. You didn't fail it. You didn't roll a nat one. You didn't fail your, your your check. But if you don't tell the GM or DM exactly what's happening or exactly what you're doing, it's up to the DM at that point. And I'm gonna I, and, and like I said, I will go the dark side. I will I will tend to go the opposite way of good. So here's good. Here's me. I will go way over here. Okay. If you're doing an attack roll, right? And you roll a two. Make it fun. Well, as I swing, I swing around three times and I stop and I look at him and realizing that I missed. Have fun. This is not, oh, I swing and miss. I swing and miss. Yeah, you can be. But know what the rolls do. If you roll a nat one and, you're, and your DM goes, give me a strength check to see if you hang on to your sword. Roll. Five. As I swing around, I, I, I instinctually grab on and I'm holding on as tight as I can. Give your DM something to work with. If you give your DM or GM something to work with on the roll, more than likely it's going to go your way. But if you leave it up to the GM or DM, guess what? You drop your sword. Your sword flies off. Get, roll me a D8 to find out which way it goes. But if you help the DM or GM out, right, and, and you kind of go with the story, I roll a nat one, 
I'm seeing if I hold on to my sword because I just rolled a net one and I really missed bad. I grab on with the other hand and I swing and I realize, oh no. More than likely, me as a GM or DM, I'm going to say, yeah, you, you swing around, you are off balance, you're going dis- to have a disadvantage on your next attack roll, or I will say, your opponent will now have advantage on the next attack roll. That's better than dropping your sword. So you have to role play, know what your dice rolls do. You know, if, if, if you're, I'm going to go over some ability scores in a little bit, and we'll go more into that. But know what your dice rolls do. Help the GM or DM by explaining what your dice roll. If you rolled a 10, okay, say I read it, and but I'm, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm really understanding what I'm reading. Am I? That helps the GM or DM with the story. You're supposed to be driving the story. He's just supposed to be the driver. You're the engine. He's just steering you in the right direction. So help him steer you in the right direction by taking that extra step. Now, then, like I said, I was going to get into some, so something, uh, something else. Like I said, this is a lengthy video, and I do apologize, but there's a lot to cover, and I want to cover some of the basics. So um, understand your ability scores. Your ability scores, right here. Okay. Now then. I have always used the tomato, and I'm sure many of you out there that are watching this video have heard this. I use the tomato for the ability scores. Strength, the ability to crush the tomato in your hand. Dexterity. Dexterity is the ability to take that tomato, throw it at a target, and hit the target. Constitution. Your constitution is your ability to have a rotten, molded tomato, eat it, and want another one. Intelligence. Intelligence is knowing that a tomato is a fruit, not a vegetable. Tomato is a fruit. That's intelligence. Wisdom. Wisdom is knowing that a Tomato, even though it's a fruit, does not go into fruit salad. Charisma. Charisma is the ability to sell a fruit salad with tomatoes in it. I've used that for a long time, and it's actually gotten through to some people, but some people forget. Now then, I will go into... One thing on this right here that I think is very important to go into, that's intelligence versus wisdom. A lot of times um, they'll say, I want to do a, I think it's history check, right? I believe history is intelligence. I would like to do a intelligence check to know if I know what this item is. Roll the dice. Five. Pause. No, you don't know what this item is. Okay, I am my turn. Help the GM or DM out. If you fail your intelligence check, say, tell you what, I want to do a wisdom check on it now to see if I know what to do with it. Roll nap 20 on your wisdom check. I pick it up and I put it into the hole. The door opens. You didn't know it was a key. You didn't know it was going to open the door. All you knew is that it was round. It looked like the same size as the hole in the door. So you picked it up and you put it in. That's wisdom. That's knowing that this is going to fit in here. That's not intelligence. You didn't know it was a key. You didn't know it was the key to the door. You didn't know that it was going to open the door. All you knew is that it's round. It looks like it fits. I pick it up and I put it in there. That's wisdom. That's knowing how things fit together. That's very important. Intelligence is knowing what something is, but wisdom is knowing how to use that item. You may know how to use it, but you may not know what it is. And yes, there is a difference. And I will fight for that forever. 
is because you can know what an item does without actually knowing what the item is. I didn't know it was a key. I just know that, oh, well, look, it's square. It fit into the square hole. Wow. It opened the door. That's not intelligence. That's not knowing it's the key. That's wisdom knowing that I have a square object that fits in a square hole. Period. Help your GM or DM out. Know what the ability scores do. Just because you have a 10 in intelligence does not make you stupid. I'm tired of hearing that. Oh, I got a 10 in intelligence. I'm dumb. No, you're not. You're average. You're average. You're just like everybody else in the world. There's no difference between you and Joe Blow down the street. That's 10. 15. You're smarter than Joe Blow down the street, but you're not as smart as the most intelligent person ever. A five. You're less intelligent than, than Joe Blow, but you know how to breathe, you know how to walk, you know how to drink, you know how to eat. You're not walking around with drool slobbering out. Like, <laughs> no, that's not a five. That just means you're less intelligent than the average person. I don't think any GM or DM out there is going to make you have a five for intelligence. If they do, I'm sorry for you and you need to go find a new GM or DM. Unless that's the way you run your games or have been running your games. Because that's not, I mean, no. Ten is the minimum that I would almost have any time. I think I had a couple with an eight and that's because they wanted to stick with it. I didn't make them. They were like, well, yeah, I have an eight. Well, do you want to re-roll? I'll let you re-roll everything or you can keep that. Well, I'll keep it. Okay, fine. You're done. But you need to know what your ability scores do. You need to know how they fit into your character. If you have a high intelligence and a high wisdom, guess what? Everything around you makes sense. You know what things are. You know how they fit into the world. You know how to use them around you. If you have a high intelligence and a low wisdom, you may know what things are, but you may not know how to use them. If you have a high wisdom and a low intelligence, you may not know what something is, but you know where to use it. You know square holes, square peg, book. Keep that in mind. When you're role-playing a character, you need to know what your stats do. If you have a high stat and a low stat, you need to know what you can do, what you can't do. Yes, that's a little bit of homework for you. I'm sorry. But if you want to have fun playing this game, a little bit of homework is what you're going to have to do. Now, am I saying memorize everything? No, you don't have to memorize everything. That's why we have the book. Have the book there in front of you. If you're a first-time player and you're sitting down for the first time, I don't expect you to know everything inside that player handbook as a GM or DM. But if you have the book open in front of you, I'm going to give you a few extra seconds or even a minute or so to look something up to see if you can do it or not. Now, some of my players that I've been playing with for over two and a half years, when I look at them in initiative and I go, what would you like to do now? And they're like shuffling through their spell cards for the seventh time going, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Okay, well, your turn is over. You're deciding what to do next. Part of role-playing is knowing what you're going to do. And guess what? That comes into the mind. Next thing. Oh, wow, that was a perfect little feed right into there. Play your character. Okay? That's going to be important. Play your character. You need to know the difference between yourself and the character you're playing. Know the differences. Sit there and go, okay, my character would do this, this, and this. I would do this, this, and this. Right? If I was confronted in a combat situation to where I have two bad guys and a good guy over here, would I save him or would I attack them first? Well, me as a person, I think killing them first would be important. Okay, so I would kill them first, then save the person. Well, the character I'm playing is a, is a cleric. 
So what would the cleric do? Well, the cleric, he wants to heal the person first, then he will defend that person after he heals them. There's a difference between what I would do and what my character would do. Role-playing is knowing that difference. Using the information you have and going forward. You have to know the differences between yourself and the character you're playing in order to role play it correctly. I would never try to sneak into a room full of bad guys. Even if I was invisible, I wouldn't do it. This came from one of my old campaigns. Me personally, I don't care if you cast greater invisibility on me and nobody can see me. I'm not walking in a room full of 15 bad guys. Sly, on the other hand, turns around to Pixie and goes, Yeah, cast greater invisibility on me. I got this. Dashed to the other side of the room, killed almost instantly with assassination. The big bad guy causing everybody to scatter. Pix comes in, does gravity on the room, lifts everybody up, everybody falls down, everybody's prone. It was a meat market inside that room. Sly rushed in. Sly didn't care. That's what Sly does. Me personally, I would never do that. So you need to know the difference between what you would do and what your character would do in roleplay. Now, we've already gone over uh, roll the dice, but you need to roll the dice. This is a dice rolling game. That, that's, that, that's, this whole thing is based upon dice rolls. Okay? If you are conflicted about what to do, roll the dice. Let the dice decide and live with that dice roll. Too many times in some of my campaigns, I've told somebody, um, give me a check. They fail the check. But they ended up doing it anyway. And if you fail a check, that means you didn't do it. Find a new way. Don't put the DM or GM in a situation where he has to call you out in front of everybody going, no, you failed the check. You can't do that. There's nothing worse than a GM or DM having to call a character out in the middle for not role playing correctly. So you need to know what, what, what the dice rolls mean and you need to follow the dice rolls. If a dice roll says that you missed the target, you missed the target. If the dice roll says that you didn't intimidate that person, guess what? You did not intimidate that person. You need to find a new way to handle the situation. If, if you fail a charisma save, and you don't follow the rules, be prepared for the GM or DM to call you out. It's part of the game. It's part of role play. It's not you personally. The DM isn't looking at you going, DM Kevin, I don't like you, so therefore you failed your charisma check, so now you are going to be a charmed person for the rest of this campaign. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, is that you failed that check, now there are consequences for failing the check. And if you're playing this game correctly, you will follow the rules and you will do it. Because that's part of role playing. You may not like it. You may think it's the worst thing in the world. But guess what? That's part of the role playing aspect of D&D is the fact that if the dice say something, you follow what the dice say. The last thing I want to cover 
uh, for everybody out there today is going to be let it flow. Um, this is one of the biggest things. If you watch Kind of Critical Role uh, on Geek and Sundry, uh, if you watch that show, that they're they're phenomenal. It flows. They don't even have to think twice, and and the reason they don't have to think twice is because once they sit down at that table, they become their character. They're not Laura Bailey anymore. They're not Travis Willingham anymore. They're not Liam anymore. They're not... No. They're, they're not. They are their characters. And as long as they're at that table, they will be their characters. And if I can tell one thing to, to any new GM out there, or new DM out there, is this. Make a motto for your table, for your room, for your house. Leave it at the door. And when I say leave it at the door, I mean leave your cell phones. Leave your personal life. Leave it at the door. You want to have a fun, exciting campaign? When you sit down at the table for the next time, be your character. Use their voice, use their mannerisms, use whatever special things that you do for them. You want to make it special for everybody there? As soon as you sit down, Kevin's gone. I'm sly. So, what are we doing today? I think, uh, you know, we've already we've looked around this room all we can. I'm not sure what else we can do in here. You know, it's like, anybody got any ideas? If you want to talk about your daily stuff, if you want to talk about do it on breaks, do it outside the room. Once you sit down at that table, it needs to be slides here. How's everybody doing today? Everybody feeling okay? You might need a rest. I, I got a potion on me. If anybody needs a potion, you know what I'm saying? I'll tell you what. I won't even charge a full price. I'll only give two silver and it's yours. Okay, fine. Gee whiz. If you want to have fun with your campaign, be your character as soon as you sit down. While you're unloading the stuff out of your bags onto the table... Act like your character's doing it. Man, I got so many dice here. I mean, I can't wait to roll all these dice because I got some incredible damage. Oh my gosh, these are my damage dice here. Look at that. Bring damage dice. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm rolling these today. Oh, look at this beautiful character sheet. Oh, what does this say down here? Oh, I have 485 platinum pieces. <gasps> oh my, I'm rich. I think I'm going to go buy a castle after this. After we get done today, I'm going to go buy a castle. Have fun. Why not? You're there for you're, you're there to play D&D. What is it? The DM has to go, okay, we're starting, and you're like, uh, no, okay, I'm a character now. No. Make it easy. Make it easy for the GM or DM. I think I've said that how many times now? If you make it easier for the GM or DM, you will have more fun in your campaign, I promise. Leave it at the door. Too many people have all their spells on their cell phone. That's just my personal opinion. With all these apps and with everything else that goes on, it's so easy to go, oh no, I have I, I, I have my cell phone here because all, all my spells are on here. On the back, or on this sheet right here, you can write down all your spells. Know your spells. They sell spell cards for a reason. So you have quick reference to your spells and know exactly what they do without having to hold your phone in your hand. 
the whole session. Because I will tell you, and I have seen it before, when you have your cell phone in your hand, it's not your turn. It's too easy to check social media. It's too easy to check emails. It's too easy to have your phone go off with a text. Leave it at the door. You're there to play a game. You're there to have fun with other people. You're there to interact with them. You're not there to be on social media or checking your email or checking your text. If you want to do that, do it on break. Do it before session or after session. And have fun. We're in a world right now that everything goes by so quick, so fast. Everybody, You want it now. You want it now. You want it now. D&D needs to be fun. In order for you to enjoy D&D, in order for you to be a better role player, you need to put away the electronics, pull out a pencil, pull out your player handbook, and play the game it was supposed to be played. Well, folks, Thank you so much. I know this was a long video, but uh, you know I will be covering more in depth into certain parts of role playing coming up. I uh, definitely wanted to uh, uh, just kind of get an overview of role playing in general, what it is to me. Uh, know your races, know your classes, understand your ability scores, and let it flow. But most of all, Leave it at the door. For Devination Gaming, I'm DM Kevin. And just remember, if you can't crawl through the dungeon, at least look through the light. Bye, everybody.